90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. The Virginia wine industry is an important component of our agriculture and horticulture economy. Virginia's wine industry generates $1.3 billion in economic impact and provides more than 8,200 jobs for the Commonwealth. With over 280 wineries, Virginia ranks as the fifth largest winemaking state in the nation. We've been producing wine for more than 400 years now in Virginia and have earned the reputation of producing world-class wines. You just heard from Dr. Jewel Bernal. She is Commissioner of the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. There's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in Virginia wine country, and that enthusiasm is spreading around the world. Over the past generation, wine production in Virginia has grown exponentially, and the quality of Virginia wines, well, they are being noticed globally. Virginia is now celebrating four centuries of winemaking history. If you've ever visited a vineyard in spring, summer, or fall, you know that Virginia wineries are, they're picturesque, they're colorful, they're historic, and most Virginia vineyards are what might be considered fine-tuned examples of what can be done in horticultural production. When we talk about the history of making wine in Virginia, a lot of famous names from the 18th century come up. Names like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. But the history of wine in Virginia traces back to the early 17th century and Jamestown. That's where the colonial house of Burgesses, sitting in the Jamestown church, created Act 12 which required colonists to plant grape vineyards. Most of the colonists planted European varieties, specifically those that were popular in France. In the early 1620s, tens of thousands of what you may call old country vines were planted in the vicinity of Jamestown and Williamsburg. Decades of trial and error followed, and within a couple of generations, Virginia's terrain began to show signs of real promise. By the mid to late 1700s, there was a hope that Virginia colonists may be able to one day produce wines of equal quality as those found in Europe. While Thomas Jefferson was serving as Minister to France from 1785 to 1789, he learned of the term terroir. Wine enthusiasts tried to define terroir as the specificity of place which includes not only the soil in a region, but also the climate, the quality of the air, the aspect of the vineyards, and anything else that can possibly differentiate one piece of land from another. Jefferson, like other wine grape growers, he knew Virginia had good terroir. A colleague of mine with Virginia Public Television produces a program called Unwind. Her name is Tassie Pippert, and she has graciously agreed for us to include some of her interviews with Virginia winemakers on this episode of Virginia Farming. One of the winemakers we met and talked with is renowned Virginia winemaker Gabrielle Rossé. He's a native of northern Italy and grew up in the winemaking industry of Europe. In our opinion, Rossé is the master. He truly understands soil, plant, and terroir. We asked Rosé about Jefferson and about growing fruit such as wine grapes in Virginia. I think that the answer to your question was given by Thomas Jefferson a couple of hundred years ago 
when he said that the best thing to do in Virginia is uh, to grow fruit trees. So forget about uh, everything else. And the reason is uh, when the soil is poor, uh, the fruit tree, the grapevine or the apple tree or the peach tree, whatever, is so worrying about not having enough food for their children that uh, uh, the plant really focus on the quality of the fruit, few fruit trees which are there. So quantity is not the issue, quality is the issue. So the fruit tastes very good in Virginia, it doesn't matter where you plant them. Of course there are better soil and there are soil which are not so perfect, but I assure you that the thing I love the most in Virginia is uh, to blend uh, the same variety of grapes uh, grown in two different kinds of soil. And uh, the dimension of the wine which come out from that is unbelievable because there are so many little, you know, flavor and things which are, which are really make the wine irresistible. So I can't believe it that Virginia is the perfect place to grow grapevines and fruit trees, but it is. Numerous vineyards are beneficiaries of Rosset's research, including Williamsburg Winery. Patrick Duffler is chief executive officer of the family operation which began in 1985. A portion of this land was producing grapes 400 years ago as part of Act 12 from the Virginia House of Burgesses. He explains the beginnings of Williamsburg Winery's Wessex 100. Uh, in 1985, uh, we planted uh, the first three acres of Chardonnay uh, and everything that could possibly go wrong in a vineyard that first year Did. went wrong. Uh, the biggest issue that we had is that the Chardonnay took very well, um, but um, the posts that were designed to carry the trellis uh, arrived late. So we were not able to get uh, the vines trained adequately, uh, and as a result we had uh, vineyards growing on the ground as opposed to straight up the way they should be, which meant that we couldn't mow, which meant that all of a sudden those six feet weeds arrived again. The house became known uh, as the uh, um, you know, we became a Chardonnay house. Our Act 12 Chardonnay yeah. um, was um, pretty much in, in most um, or at least many of the high-end restaurants uh, in, both in Virginia but also in Manhattan. Dad decided that he would make use of the, the history of Virginia, uh, the romance of Virginia, uh, to lay that over uh, the uh, branding efforts that we were making. So I, I reference Act 12. Yes. Um, the twelfth act of the Virginia House of Burgesses uh, made uh, all Virginia landowners plant and maintain a small vineyard in order to try to encourage uh, the development of the Virginia wine industry. Yeah, wow. So it was a, a bit of a failure, of course, uh, back in 1619. <laughs> but uh, we thought that uh, yeah, in, uh, making, ref referencing the history of Virginia on the, on the bottle in the, the late 20th century was, was worthwhile. an opportunity through an AFID grant announcement to visit the um, winery at Bull Run in Centerville, Virginia. Uh, it was on a beautiful historic property, it had historic buildings on the property and a lot of history behind the land that the vineyard was on. But there we found a, a very young couple who had invested in this land and were doing some really unique things with Virginia wines. One thing that was particularly unique, and I think that we need to really focus on that, was they were doing their own grape production. And that is something that we really want to push. We would love to get 100% of our wines derived from Virginia grown grapes. We're not there yet, but we're moving towards that. They were producing about 40 acres of their own grapes that they were using in their own wines, named after their own children. And so you could see that family connection and that commitment to telling the story of the history of Fairfax County, along with beautiful scenery where I could see people getting married and coming together, and also telling that story of how they have kept that family connection going in their product. Those are things that you, those are experiences that you can't make up. <laughs> They're very unique and 
Each Virginia winery has its own story to tell. Another colorful character in Virginia's wine industry is Jenny McLeod. She is proprietor of Chrysalis Vineyards and the Ag District Center in Middleburg, Virginia. Well, Norton is an incredible grape. Uh, I have been a cheerleader for Norton, and as, as, as you mentioned before, I came to Virginia in, um, uh, started Chrysalis in 1998. Actually had the first wine that was a Viognier with the Chrysalis label was a 97 made at another winery. But in 98, we planted our first Norton and the 2000 vintage was the first one. And um, I just fell in love with this grape. It is the most disease resistant grape that I'm aware of. I'm pretty sure that's true, commercially anyway. There maybe are some hybrids or something that are growing somewhere. And not just one of, but the most. It grows on its own roots. So it doesn't need grafting on American roots like European mm -hmm. vines. Um, it's super resistant to the mildews and rots and all that can affect grapevines, particularly European grapevines. So if anybody's talking about um, low impact agriculture uh, or sustainable uh, grape production, you can't leave out natives. You know, we do have to care for it. It's not, you know, it's, it's not leave it alone all right. by itself. It sure. still is a plant and, and there's still a lot of it right here. So we do have to to care for it, but um, uh, it, we don't worry about spring frosts very much or winter kill. It's cold hardy down to minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't grow right away like the European, so it starts growing later because it knows that it could be cold. And right. so it has a wonderful wild American character to yes. it. But what it does not have, I think is the most important thing. And it doesn't have that kind of skunky, funky, yeah. what they call foxy. So it's got a very clean, albeit kind of grapey, yeah. but it's very clean and it's um, in that grapiness without any of the um, sort of, um, I, 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 it's hard to describe. The mm. wine people call it foxiness. Yes. And so I liken it, you know what? I have a little audio, um, I have an audio demonstration, yes, right? Wonderful. So. Uh, do you know of Concord? And I don't really mean to trash Concord or the other Labruscas, but the problem with Concord is it kind of sounds like Yes. And Norton, all, although the tone is very similar, is like Oh, so, sure. <laughs> so, Exactly. So it's very clean, very yeah. pure, yeah. and it's um, yeah, quintessentially American. It's Virginia's native grape. Yes. Named after Daniel Norton of Richmond, Virginia. Oh. It's all about quality, according to Rosse. We asked him to offer his advice to the landowner or farmer who is considering growing wine grapes on a commercial scale. I will tell him, first of all, don't shoot for the quantity, shoot for the quality. Because, uh, uh, you know, when I came to Virginia, I was challenged on the quantity of the grapes I was, I was able to produce per acre. And I remember in 1979, in the Cabernet Sauvignon at Babus, I produced nine tons per acre, which was insane, right? And they told me, so, you know, how did you do that? Well, I said, you know, if you don't care how long your vineyard is going to last, you can produce nine tons one year, then try to sell the wine to whoever doesn't know anything about wine, and, and then you can retire with the money you made, right? But uh, if you want to produce quality wine, you cannot produce nine tons. The quantity that you produce per acre will make a big difference. And you know that a lot of people, you know, drop some of the grapes now to make a better wine, right? And it works, right? It's like, you know, for a mother to have 20 children or to have two children. If she has two children, she can really focus on them, you know, raise them, take care of them. If she has 20, it's going to be a disaster. So the same thing for the grapes. What's in the octagon is uh, a blend composed by, uh, com composed by um, wine producing some of our best parcels within the farm. Yes. The, uh, the vineyard is 185 acres. And it's only about 20 acres mm -hmm. that go into this wine. 
But what's interesting is that this wine is actually what made us open this restaurant. Huh. I remember we made the first uh, world class wine in 1987. Yes. And I noticed, and I, the owner noticed it, and wine writers noticed, were noticing it. And it was 97 Octagon. And I told the owner, I say, we made a great wine now, but we have to promote it. And I think yes. the best way to promote a great wine is a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And it was actually quite an undertaking for us to open a restaurant because we own it, we manage it, we staff it. And it's a business that can be quite complicated at times, yes. as we all know. But we did it. In 99, we opened Palladio Restaurant. Yes. I can go on and on about how it's made and the barrels and right. the parcels and the blending. It's, it's a very complex wine. Right. But I don't want to do that. I want to tell you that how we do it really is by doing a lot of work in the vineyard, mm -hmm. uh, very precise work, being, a, being able to choose and have the courage to not make this wine when a vintage is not the standard we demand, right. Right. and therefore we didn't produce it in 2003, mm -hmm. 2011, mm -hmm. and 2000 actually also because it was not good enough. Right. So that way we can keep a very high standard. Yes. And, uh, and also it's a wine that in aging uh, does very well. Yes. It can age uh, easily uh, to 20 years and we can say that because we have 20 year old bottles mm -hmm. at this point that are still in perfect condition. There is something about a vineyard that attracts tourists. Wineries are becoming more and more of a destination every year. Stephanie Pence is with Bricks and Columns Vineyard near McGackiesville, Virginia. She sat down with Tassie Pippert to talk about the, the combination of agritourism, growing grapes, and making fine wines. So my husband and I bought this farm um, back in 2003, and we were doing hay and cattle on it. Yeah. And um, about oh, five, five or six years ago, um, we had several people approach us about doing weddings and things here. Yeah. And so we, we thought, well, we could do that. And so started looking into doing that. And when we did, we started talking with another winery. Um, just about event things and they were looking for more space to grow grapes and so um, we said you know hey we would love for you all to look at our space weddings yeah. and wine go very well together yes um, so when they came over in Virginia everything is about site suitability right. and um, so they wanted to come over look at our property make sure we were suitable for growing grapes so they did and um, said yes we were suitable for growing grapes um, but then they found land closer to them and so um, that got us thinking, well, if they could grow grapes, we can too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, um, um, as you know, probably doing these shows, the wine industry in Virginia is very open yes. and very supportive of one another. Yes. And so we had um, about four other people come over. Um, we are blessed just being in this area. Charlottesville is sort of the hub where a lot of training goes out and um, just had about four other people look at our land to make sure that we were on track and that we yeah. could grow grapes and they all said yes we can. We can't grow every varietal but we can grow. We're a good site for growing. Sure. So we um, so we started planning. So we planted our first vines about three years ago. Um, we were doing events um, in a tent prior to that until our winery got up and going and then um, are now doing events in here and with our having our tasting room open. The concept started really because Jackie and I have always enjoyed wine and we had a friend who was growing grapes uh, and making wine himself for his own use and never had enough room in his suburban yard to grow enough grapes so we invited him to come out here so we got interested that way. Uh, we spent a lot of years growing grapes and enjoyed making wine and it really started as all about the wine, not about business. Uh, at the time I sold the car dealership in 2007, we looked around and said, what do we do next? And I said, I don't know, maybe we can grow grapes on all this ground. Called Virginia Tech, Tony Wolf came down from their research station in Winchester, did a great job of outlining a plan to grow grapes. And Lee came on board, uh, he had actually just come back from a year in Germany. So he was very European in thinking at the time. Uh, he was interested. He was actually started just as a job, helping plant vines. And after doing that for a couple of years, he started helping in the winery and eventually 
fired me and relegated me to the tasting room and he took over making wine because we had a very strong consultant at the time. It worked very seamlessly. Uh, he has done a great job with both managing the vineyard and with managing the winemaking. Uh, his outlook and mine has always been first you make great wine. So if we don't make really good wine, nothing else we do really matters. And so our focus has always been wine driven. Secondarily, we have to sell it. The, uh, the rule of thumb in the industry is it takes about seven years to cash flow a vineyard. You go out first, you, you, you uh, measure out the vineyard, you decide where you're going to put it, you order the vines, you put them in the ground. Your first harvest is usually the third leaf, the third season. And then at that point you process it and make it into wine and then it will rest for some period of time, whether it's six months, a year, three years, whatever it is. But it takes a little while till that actually starts to produce anything. So you have to have kind of a long vision and you have to be very patient. Uh, and you have to live without any income for a while. If you, if you are growing wine and you want to attract people, you want to sell your product on your own property, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. We've had success with having outdoor events, whether they have been um, uh, athletic events like uh, uh, running, endurance running. Uh, we have done a lot with concerts. It's been very successful. Uh, we also have worked our way up to a tasting room that can accommodate more people. We have always struggled with having enough room inside so that in bad weather, customers had a place to go. Every now and then we grow something that one of two things happens. Either there's not the demand for the wines from that grape, or we find that that grape does not do well at this site. Uh, we have run into that several times and it usually is heartbreaking to tear out a vineyard that's been here for 10 years, as this one has. But the Norton didn't sell the volume it should have, nor did we produce the tonnage per acre we needed to make the thing work. At the same time, we had high demand for Cab Sauv. Uh, we were having to contract with other vineyards in the area to get enough Cabernet. So we were putting more Cabernet in here. And so Lee, our winemaker, loves to hold up a bottle of really fine wine and say, this is Shenandoah Valley dirt. And he, he makes the point that that's exactly what makes this happen. And so when we go to say San Francisco and we win a gold medal or a double gold as we have occasionally, he likes to point out that that was Shenandoah Valley dirt that, that went to San Francisco. Is there potential for the Virginia wine industry to reach a, a plateau of sorts? My observations are that we have, first of all, had unprecedented growth in the industry in the past 10 years. And you cannot keep growing at an unprecedented rate. At some point, that growth begins to kind of level off. I think what we're experiencing is a leveling off of the growth of the industry. Um, we have had a challenging year this past year, and that's been mostly because of weather. But if you continue to grow at such an unprecedented rate, what you're gonna end up with is a lot of supply and not enough demand. Our wines in Virginia are very unique and we want to keep them that way. They're at a price point where people kind of want to know more about that investment. There's that opportunity to share that history, to share why that wine has that price point, how it's uniquely made, and why it's going to be a really great experience for you to invest in and a great product to have. So while we're not growing at the same rate, we are continuing to grow. And I think we're leveling off in a way that the market can sustain, and that is always a good thing. Most of the people who uh, decide to plant a vineyard and to grow grapes, they don't know who their boss is. Actually, they think that because they own the land and they have enough money, they are the boss. Instead, the boss is Mother Nature, right? And Mother Nature does whatever she wants. So you have to be ready. I always tell to the people, now I don't do consulting anymore, when you do your financial plan, remember to put on your plan that one year out of 10 years you will lose everything, right? And this is called farming, right? You are rich one year, you are rich another year, and then you are so poor and so poor that you even forget what to be rich was, right? But if you keep going, uh, you know, I, I, I tell you something interesting that, you know, of course, my father being of German descent, he was always saying, whatever happened in your life, remember only one thing, immer gerade aus, which means in German, always straight ahead. 
and this is what you have to do when you are farming. Don't plan to become rich, right? But remember that to keep going is the best way to be able to fix what was broken the year uh, before. And of course, you know, this year, you know, Virginia will teach you a lesson about who the boss is, Mother Nature, right? <laughs> 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security.